Well, hey, church, once again, good morning. So glad that you're here with us. Let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn to uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, we're going to pick up in verse 19, just two verses this morning, work through uh, verse 20 as we continue in our series, which is called A King is Born. And so really uh, two uh, points this morning, two truths that we're going to talk about, that the Lord Jesus Christ is a king of glory and he is the king uh, of grace. This past week, Angie and I were able to uh, take some vacation days, and we uh, went out to Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, okay. It's been a joke all week long. Uh, even the guys on, uh, pastors on staff texting me and stuff like that. But we went out to the uh, National Finals Pro Rodeo. So we have some friends from Wynn, Terrace and Kim Matthews. Their daughter, Tacey, uh, plays fourth in the world in running barrels. And so we got to go out. There's 10 performances in the rodeo. It's just a long week. And so we got to be there for about three of them. So it's a great day, a lot of fun. When we flew in uh, Tuesday night, you know, I don't know what the... I don't know what they call Vegas. I don't know if it's a city that never sleeps or Sin City. I don't know what it's called. But yeah, it was lit up bright. You could see that thing from space, I guess. Uh, all the lights up. So we flew in and uh, we got there. And so, uh, you know, we got up uh, that next day and it's just a busy place uh, that goes on around there. And so we were able, they had a day performance because uh, uh, of what took place a week before they delayed in the start. So we got to go to two in one day. But here's what I noticed in all three of those rodeo performances that we are part of. And we like that stuff. We like, you know, we like horses and people getting chunked off horses and bulls in the dirt. I mean, you know, that's just kind of our people. And so uh, we were there. And so it, it's a lot different in person. We were at the Thomas Mack Arena right there at the University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas. And right there. And so it's different in person than watching on television. We have always watched the pro rodeo finals on RFD TV, Rural Television Network. If you got the Cowboy Channel, you can watch the rodeos all throughout the year. And so we kind of keep up with that stuff. But uh, we get there, and I, I had seen this take place on television all the nights before, but it was the same thing. So we get there, and I mean, they had fire shooting out, you know, the pyro stuff going on, horses running around. In the very beginning, I know how all that works. They did it. Uh, but then the announcer come on, he said, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I can't do the voice, but anyhow, you get it. Uh, we're going to do what we always do here at the Professional Rodeo. Tonight, we're going to give thanks to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, and everybody stands up, takes their hat off. You know, and as a preacher, you kind of go into evaluation mode when this happens, you know. Uh, he starts up, uh, and he's the rodeo announcer like, look at that man. Give it up for that man got thrown off that bull. You know, he's that kind of guy. But he's like, uh, he said, Lord, we bow in your presence. We come in the name of your son, Jesus. We are grateful for the sport of rodeo. We're grateful that we can be here. We want you to protect all the cowboys and the cowgirls, you know, and he goes on and on. And he gets to the end every time he says this, and Lord Jesus, thank you for salvation. Thank you that you died on that cross for forgiveness of sin. It's in your name we pray. And you'd hear folks all across that arena go, amen. It's packed up. Now, I know everybody in there was not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I know that, okay? But they were like, amen. And then... We would stay standing. If you had a cap on or if you had a cowboy hat or whatever, you'd take it off. you put your hand over your heart because there's a lady coming in with the flag. And they would sing the national anthem. And let me just tell you something. There wasn't anybody taking a knee in defiance of the United States of America. There wasn't any protest. The guy's praying in the name of Jesus. He didn't say we're going to have a moment of silence. He didn't say, I know that this may offend some of you. I know that this may hurt your feelings. So he didn't say any of that stuff. We prayed in the name of Jesus, and he sang the national anthem. There's some folks like me who can't sing. We were all singing along <laughs> with the person who could sing. And, and what I, I left there just realizing that there's a whole bunch of folks in that big arena that... Even though they weren't believers, they weren't ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, the Lord Jesus Christ was placed first and foremost at the forefront of it all. And there was no apology or afraid that Wrangler was going to pull their sponsorship because they prayed in the name of Jesus. And I just want to encourage, I know rodeo may not be your thing, <laughs> but I just want to encourage you. There's a bunch of good folks all across this land called the United States <laughs> who are not ashamed of Jesus. And there are folks across the land of the United States who are not followers of Christ, 
But you know what? They didn't walk out of that arena and protest. They stayed for the rodeo. Jesus was exalted. He was preeminent. He took first place. He said, as we always do, before we begin, first and foremost, we're going to thank Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. You see this passage that we're in in Colossians, it's thick and rich. It's passage of the deity of Christ. And we've been, as I call it, hammering around in it <laughs> for two or three Sundays now. And, and guess what? We're going to finish up with two verses on Christmas Eve as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together and all four services together. It's going to be great. Don't miss that. You need to plan. Bring your friends and family and be a part of that. But we're going to finish this text out there. So today, again, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ being first and foremost in everything. And the question is, as we dive into this passage, is he first in your life? You know, a lot of passages in Scripture, it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's all evangelistic, pointing to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for many who are believers, these passages, they remind us of who Christ is, lest we never forget. Because sometimes all the junk in the world that's out here floating around, it just wants to draw the joy out of you of your salvation. So hopefully today you'll be encouraged and strengthened. Hopefully, as always, I pray today that somebody comes to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he breaks through. As my heart was hard one time, he breaks through that hardness and you see him for who he is. Hey, would you stand with me if you're able for the uh, public reading of scripture? This is two verses. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. You know, if you have your Bible and you just kind of skip over to chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. I was just going to let you know that. Verse 20. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we do pray in the name of Jesus. Grateful for today. Grateful breath in our lungs. Uh, grateful that we can come together today and, 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 Lord, exalt you, Lord Jesus, and lift you up. But honor a brother, Lord, a brother that has been in our midst many years. And to honor a brother who's suffering, Lord. And so, Lord, we, we pray, Holy Spirit, we just pray, oh God, over his life. Lord, we also pray for some other dear brothers. We pray for uh, Jay Jacobs. Lord, he's, he's suffering. He's got some appointments this week and pastor on staff. We put him before you, pray for him. And we pray for our brother, Travis Grisham, Lord. He's in ICU. Lord, we just lift him up before you. Pray for his family who's there with him. And pray, Lord, the peace that goes beyond all understanding just to rest there in that room. Pray for healing of Travis's body, Lord. Lord, we pray today that you touch our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I pray you save somebody today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. All God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated. Thanks for standing for the uh, public reading of Scripture. So basically two truths in this passage. You could outline it a number of different ways, but just that the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the king uh, of glory and he's the king of grace. Paul, when he's uh, writing there, he's in prison when he's writing uh, this letter out uh, to the church there. But he says in that verse 19, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. That's a mouthful. So the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. That fullness is pleroma. That's the sum total of all the divine attributes and power residing in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, okay? So as we've been working through this passage that uh, the Lord God Almighty, Lord Jesus, pre-existent, co-existence, always been, takes on flesh, born uh, of the Virgin Mary for the purpose of going to the cross, as we just read in the next verse, give peace through his blood, going to the cross to die uh, for you and me. So it's that play Roma, the fullness, the attributes, the divine power. You know, on that mountain of transfiguration when those three are there, and it, it's almost like I've used this uh, kind of example for us, like the, the Lord God Almighty pulls back the veil, and they are able to see uh, really into the, the deity of Christ, kind of to see that aura of the person, the Son of God on that mountain, and to hear the voice from heaven say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And, and then it kind of goes back, because we know in Scripture that the Scripture tells us that People would look upon him, and, and, and in reality, we know he was a Jew. He's from the Middle East. He's from there uh, in Israel, you know, born in Bethlehem, raised up in Nazareth. But we kind of get a picture of that Middle Eastern, and, and, but really, it's no different 
from you of I. So, you know, someone may see us in a crowd and go, hey, there's nothing really special about them. But when Jesus Christ spoke, they recognized him as having authority in this. And so, again, when he says he did not, in Philippians, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He emptied himself kind of that Shekinah glory in a way, like he wasn't glowing uh, in that. He's kind of hidden from people. When he spoke, I mean, they began to see that's how folks came to that place of believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord says, for that pleroma, that fullness to dwell means to permanently dwell. Now, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and, and others, even Islam, they believe that Jesus was a created being, a, a person basically. Well, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses will say that he was uh, an angel. Mormons will say he's the brother of Satan, uh, offspring of God is how they would say that. Uh, and then Islam will say he's just a prophet. You see, Folks, when, when folks come to you and they talk about God, you got to make sure, you got to try to understand who are they talking about? Are they talking about the Christ of Scripture or are they talking about a Christ that they believe was created? Because this right here, this passage, this is not a created being. This permanently dwelling uh, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the divine attributes of power. He's always existed, always been. That's why people can become violent that's why those in Islam, Muslims can become violent when you may say, well, Jesus Christ is the Son of God because what that does, that changes everything. You know, a lot of folks are, they're okay with kind of adding Jesus to their list of gods out here. They're not really okay with him being the king. I, I, I believe I made this statement when we started this series. There are a lot of people, well, let's say for instance, I'll just use the rodeo, for example, because I'm up in the top. And I can see around, and we had some friends and some folks from Jonesboro were there too, and also so kind of sitting in the and I'm looking around. Uh, and, and I know, I don't say, well, it's, yes, it's humorous to me, okay? So you may have a person that's intoxicated who is standing for the prayer and standing for the flag, and when the prayer's over, they're like, Amen. You with me? Now, you may say, well, that's not funny. Well, just, hey, look, I lived that life. That was me. I'd probably set my beer can down when I stood up during the prayer. Now, I say this because there's a lot of, when I say good folks, like, you're stuck, they'll come pull you out. You know? The ox is in the ditch, which means the cow's out of the fence. <laughs> they'll come help you get it up. And if you ask them, do you want Jesus as your Savior? I can almost guarantee you they'll say yes. But if you ask them, do you want Jesus as your king? Oh, me. That's a whole nother realm. Because when he's the king, because he is, that's the lordship, changes everything. You know, uh, as I was preparing for this, I ran across a study by J.D. Greer. Whether you like this guy or don't like him or whatever, uh, he's, a, he's, he's pretty straight theologically. He seems to be a good guy. Everybody has an opinion on how to do church, and, and the Lord is blessed. But I ran across this because I don't think the church was originally, I may be wrong. I know they had a small group when they started, but it seems like it was kind of a rebirth. It was almost considered a church plant, but a small group of people. And so it's just grown. I mean, they're like... I don't know, like, it may be 15,000 members or something. It's just huge, and, and we've seen God do some great stuff, okay? Well, as I was preparing for this, I ran across because he made a statement. He says, a lot of times what happens in the life of a church, even in kind of a relatively new church, is that in the beginning, it knows its mission, but over time, people will move from the mission to maintenance. And that really caught my attention because I think about us, we're an old church, 1935, 36, and it's almost like every generation that comes through in the life of the church. And when you're able to be in a church, as some of you are, for a number of years, you see various generations that kind of come through the church, various age groups, college groups, and that. It's almost like each age group has to re-catch the vision, the mission of the church, the mission of the Lord. So uh, let me read to you what uh, he found. They did a survey. And he said, sometimes what happens, you know, you move from mission to maintenance in the life of a church. He says, when you start out in the beginning knowing and understanding the mission of the church and what Christ has called you to do, you will do whatever it takes to reach people for Jesus. You'll do whatever it takes, even if it's criticism or whatever. He says, but when you get to about that second generation, when sometimes it moves to maintenance, 
They don't do whatever it takes. They only do what they are asked to do. It's not they're willing to do whatever it takes, but they will only do what they're asked to do. The first generation assumes personal responsibility. The second generation assumes someone else will do it. The first generation expects personal sacrifice. The second generation expects personal comfort. Now, when I read through these, I I began to apply them to my own life. And and really for all of us, there may be somewhat of some conviction in here that comes of it. Because what happens is it's almost like uh, writing to the church of Ephesus, we we lose our first love. We don't lose our salvation. We kind of lose our first love. And things begin to, you know, the Lord is not first. As this whole passage, he's not first in our life anymore. He kind of gets pushed down. First generation will see problems and seek solutions, but the second generation sees problems and complains. The first generation, when they understand the mission and the vision of a church and what God has called them to do, they see possibilities and they dream about it, but the second generation sees barriers and reasons to quit. The first generation, they listen to God and they own the vision. The second generation questions every decision. The first generation steps out in bold trust. The second generation sits satisfied and stable. The first generation fears holding back from God, and the second generation fears commitment. The first generation feels that it is a privilege to be a part of a Lord's church, and the second generation feels entitled to the benefits of the church. Now, before, you, as we say, you take those old gnarly fingers. Now, some of you don't have gnarly fingers, and I don't even know exactly what that means, but I just say they're all roughed up or whatever. Before you start pointing at everybody else, you might all take them and point them back to yourself. Because I'm sure that all of us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can move from that place where you would say you had that red-hot heart for the Lord, and you were serving him, he was first, that pleroma, you understood. The Lord Jesus Christ, hey, in his goodness, saved you, pulled you out of the darkness, and put you into the light. You were unashamed, you were bold, you were courageous. I mean, you know, you would say, God put on my heart about something, and you didn't give up till it came to fruition. But what's happened that maybe you moved from the first part of that, now you're in the second generation. And every time that you, you know, you see a problem when used to, you would attack it. Hey, look, there are problems. There are things that happen. You know, I would admit when people come and they say, hey, I see a problem. I say, okay, how can we fix that problem? And they're like, well, that's your job. I'm like, you know, I got a lot of jobs. (laughs) Won't you help me out? You know, I do much better with some solutions, you know, some options than, than criticism and complaining about something. But all of us have gone from here to Over here, oh, it's just too much. We can't do that. When before you could, what happened? What happened in our lives that we lost it? It's not that we lose our salvation. Maybe we just kind of forget who he is and why we're here. In fact, what happened, we kind of moved him out of first place in our life and we got him out here with all this other stuff. You see, he's the the king of, of glory, but also too, he's the king of grace. Look at that second verse, verse 20. And through him to reconcile all things himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now, I read this this past week. It's, I, I, I don't know how you are. I read stuff. Maybe you read stuff you probably got an idea about, but something just really stands out. So I was reading this. I was studying for this, reading a commentary, and it, it made the statement, okay, Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, I know what some of you guys, you think it's all Eve's fault in the garden. Well, guess what, guys? Adam was there, and he was passive, Okay. He was sitting back. (laughs) He was just watching and he didn't intervene because God had given him the message. God had told him uh, what not to do. Now, Adam and Eve, equal, we understand that, but, you know, he could have stepped up and said, hey, Satan, that's not what God said, no, but he was there. He was passive, and so they both fell into sin. And so when God came looking in the garden and calling out, he wasn't calling out for Eve. He was calling out for Adam. He held Adam responsible, so you can't can't get away from that one. But... They fell into sin. They disobeyed God. And they sought their way than God's way. Well, commentator said this. He said, when that happened in the garden, Adam and Eve declared war on God. Now, I had to read that a couple of times. I thought, well, that's a pretty strong statement. But we know there's hostility between God and man. It's that sin, okay? And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ, he's that one that gives peace, reconciles us through his blood. So the commentator said they declared war on God. So I kind of chewed on that one a little bit. He says, but when God came walking in the garden, 
and calling out. He was not declaring war on them. He was pursuing them in order to bring peace. And in fact, if you know your scripture, if you know your Bible and you know the story, you know there was an animal sacrifice that took place. Not a whole lot said about it, but he clothed them in skins. So that means uh, it was at one time a live animal. It's a first blood sacrifice, which is pointing to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, basically what we do as unbelievers, we've declared war on God. We want our way over his way. But God does not declare war on us. He pursues us. He comes after us. And so when it says there in the next part of that verse, okay, it says so. He reconciled all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now that peace, that's that peace between God and man. Let me read to you just some, a few words that you probably know. But these are some words we see in Scripture, but just some doctrine of salvation key terms. Justification. Justification, here's what it means. We stand before God guilty, but we are declared as righteous. When we come to him in faith and repentance, we stand before him as guilty, but we are declared righteous. Redemption. We stand before God as a slave, but we are granted freedom. Reconciliation. We stand before God as his enemy, but we become his friend. That's being reconciled. Adoption. We stand before God as a stranger, but we are made a son or doubted. This reconciliation, so there's, there's hostility between us and God. The Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary shed his blood. You know, when I, I think about, because I've got those visual images, and it all comes from old movies, you know, we watched or whatever, but also what we see in Scripture. That the Lord Jesus Christ, he's, he is flogged by the Romans. He's flogged by those military people. They know how to whip somebody to the point of death. The Bible tells us he was unrecognizable in his visage. You couldn't even really tell who he was. He'd been beaten so bad and whipped so bad. And he carries a cross, cross beam to Calvary. And he's there between two thieves. And it's there that the blood is flowing from his body. And the Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And all those animal sacrifices, all the stuff in the past was pointing toward the great sacrifice who was going to come, our atonement. And through his blood that was shed at Calvary, he grants peace. And we, they put him in that tomb, and the third day he comes out because the grave could not hold him. Now, here's, a, here's kind of the meat of that and the good stuff of that. You and I, as sinners, having declared war on God, many, like I was for so long, did I want him as my Savior? If you ask somebody, most people, if you ask them, do you want forgiveness of sin? Most people who have a little bit of knowledge of the Bible are going to say yes. If you ask them, do you want Jesus as your Savior? The answer is probably going to be yes. Do you want him as your king? What does that mean? Because you think king is person in authority. Someone in authority who rules your life. Someone in authority who points you in a direction. Someone in authority who has expectations out of you. Someone who in authority has a purpose and a mission for you. You know, that's where you count the cost. Do I want this person, this Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who died at Calvary, do I want him being the boss of my life? Do I want him being the ruler of my life? Am I willing to submit myself as a slave? to the Lord Jesus Christ to do what he wants me to do, to go where he points me, to be the person that he has called me to be. That is called counting costs. That's why the Bible says, if you're going to come after me, Jesus said, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Yes, majority of folks, especially in Arkansas, <laughs> they want him as their Savior. But do you want him as your king? Because he is the king. He's the king of the church. He's the king of creation. He's the king of the universe. He is the king, Lord God Almighty. He's the king of the Jews. He is king. And he's coming back on a white horse one day. Do you want him as your king? Because that's who he is. You don't get him how you want him. You receive him as he is. He's a king. And he died. Here's the thing. He died for you and me. For every old cowboy that was, couldn't hardly stand up during the prayer, was weaving when he had his hat over his heart because he's intoxicated. For every old cowboy who said amen at the end of the prayer, Jesus died for him. 
For every old cowboy, he says, yeah, I want you as my savior, but not as my king. He died for him. You see, folks, I don't know where you are today. <laughs> and I know this world, hey, let's just be, I'm, I'm always trying to be real. But let me just be real. Give me three minutes, okay? We're about to go out here, and some of you are going to get to go see Eric and love on him. Hey, listen to me. If you think about what's fair, that just doesn't seem to be fair. The hurt, the pain, the suffering. It takes two hours to get dressed. Erica load up and drive to Memphis, scares us to death, you know. Serves the church, serves you, serves me. All I know is we know a Savior who is good in the midst of the pain and hurt. And I know because I know what the Scripture says. He didn't promise us everything is going to be rosy on this earth. But, oh, my dear friends, rosy does not describe heaven. <laughs> it's good. I know we look around and there's hurt, there's pain. There's people who have dishonored you. There's people who have left you. There's people who have hurt you. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But at the end of the day, God is good. And you know what? We had to put our focus on him. He has to be first in all things. And when you just, I call it basking in the king of glory and king of grace, you just let the presence of the Lord kind of just run over you and overwhelm you. That's how you have the joy of the Lord's salvation, you know? That's why your comfort, your peace is not found in this world and these things. There are things that bring happiness and joy. I get that, but... Our comfort and our peace is, is only found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So maybe as a believer here, and I know I say it quite often, but this world just, man, it draws on you during the week and stuff. I mean, it's just pulling on you. And, and maybe you kind of lost that joy. You moved from that first generation kind of to the second part. Now all you do is complain and criticize and, you know, and you're just sitting and there's no nothing. And, and maybe you say, Lord, what's wrong with me? Just say, Lord, call it because he's pursuing you. Let's call upon and say, Lord, I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again. But Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Just be right with him. But then also I know this. There's folks here. And somebody needs to be saved. And it's a real simple question. You want him as your Savior? You want him as your Lord? You know, and you say, what does that mean? It means he's your Lord. You say, well, I want to know what comes after that. It doesn't work that way. You take a step of faith. And you trust that whatever he may have for you is better than anything you have now. And you come to him in faith and repentance. And you, uh, you repent, you turn away from sin. And you turn in faith to him, he'll save you. He, he'll move you from that place of declaring war on God to being reconciled. And there's peace, he'll save you today. Just like he did in my life at the age of 25. He'll save you today. I encourage you to call upon him. Father, as we pray this morning, in this time of invitation, Lord, you're so good to us. And Lord, we look around at the hurt and the pain of this world. And Lord, we may sometimes see just crazy stuff and going on. But Lord, we know you're in charge. We know you're in control. And we just look to you, Lord Jesus. We know the end of the story. We know how it all ends. Lord, may we just be found faithful. Lord, I pray this morning, I know there are believers here, maybe some who just need to, they just need to get right, Lord, with you. They need to settle some stuff with you. Maybe that takes place. I pray, I pray no one would be ashamed of you, Lord. I pray there'd be boldness and courage and, uh, uh, and Lord, just to exalt you to the Lord to really, they're not ashamed to let people know, hey, you're first place in my life, Lord Jesus. But Lord, I know there are also those here who need to be saved today. And I, I pray, Lord, they'd call upon you just in saving faith, trusting, believing in you, looking to you, Lord, understanding that you are the king of glory and the king of grace. And Lord, that you died on that cross for them. May they come to you in salvation today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we stand?